This story starts in the cave back in December of 2024. So, while Neil was slicing his cake, we decided to scurry off and have a look inside this Amiga 500 Plus that Matt had, had donated to him. Lee from the channel More From Making It suggested to Matt that I would be the man to repair it. I think that mostly because he just did not want the headache, and I can understand that. Really can. Well, I'm fairly sure we've all encountered corrosion. Salt water on metal, for instance. Nothing really happens at the start, but over time it starts to corrode and turns the metal into something that's weak and brittle. Well, a very similar thing is happening inside many vintage computers, but in this case it's not rust. It's a creeping chemical reaction that is destroying the tiny connections that you need to make the computer work. There is often a little battery for inside computers, and that's for the real-time clock, so that it can keep time while the machine's turned off. In the case of many older machines, this is a nickel-cadmium battery, or NICAD, and this uses a reaction between cadmium and nickel oxide, but it's not the nickel or the cadmium that are the problem. It's the electrolyte used, which is potassium hydroxide. And because many of these batteries are completely internal and soldered to the motherboard, like in the Amiga 500 Plus, they sit innocuously undetected, leaking their electrolyte. Often I have heard people refer to this as battery acid damage, when it's quite the opposite. Potassium hydroxide is in fact an alkali, and that means it corrodes and reacts with metals in a very interesting and destructive way. Now if you think just removing the battery will solve the problem, Unfortunately, that's not the case. Potassium hydroxide is hydroscopic. It means it continues to pull moisture from the atmosphere and keeps reacting with the copper and other metals and materials on the motherboard. So the damage continues long after the battery has been removed. This hydroscopic nature of potassium hydroxide is the main reason why many of these older machines suffer so much damage because they're often left in moisture-rich environments like lofts and garages. In those environments, this electrolyte thrives and eats the board silently while time passes by. So now we've established what's going on, how do we stop it? The first thing I'm going to use is a citric acid-based window cleaner. This contains, well, citric acid. That reacts with the potassium hydroxide and neutralizes it. Once the window cleaner has done its work, I can wash that away with isopropyl alcohol. When potassium hydroxide reacts with copper traces, it produces copper hydroxide. That's the greenish gunk you can see here. This, if left untreated, continues to react with the oxygen in the air, turning it into copper carbonate, which is the flaky blue-green layer you'll often find on copper statues or on corroded pipes. Copper that should be carrying electrical signals between chips is eaten away turning what should be a solid electrical connection into a gap. But that's not the full story, and this is where things get possibly slightly worse. Most of the solder joints in Vinci's computers use tin lead solder. When potassium hydroxide reacts with the tin in the solder, it forms tin hydroxide. Over time, tin hydroxide can break down further into tin oxide, which is non-conductive. So instead of a strong solder joint, connecting between components, you end up with a crumbly, brittle mess. This can lead to strange issues, intermittent faults, glitches, or the complete failure of a machine. Tin hydroxide and tin oxide, for that matter, are white, powdery substances, and depending on the composition of the solder used, it's entirely possible that you could degrade solder completely to a powder. I believe this is the phenomenon observed by Chris Edwards. Desoldering the socket, and all this like cocaine dust fell out. I don't know what it is. Look at it. It fell out of the socket when I took it out. Suggesting that the solder originally used in these machines was particularly high in tin. In the case of the Amiga 500 Plus, repairing the motherboard is naturally your only course of action. Thanks to the shared projects on PCBWay, the sponsor of this video. 
They provide PCB prototype fabrication from as little as $5. You can have a new PCB for your Amiga 500 Plus created and shipped to you. PCBWay have over 10 years experience producing high quality PCBs and they've also branched out into other services like 3D printing, metal fabrication and CNC machining. And if you're not confident with a soldering iron, you can even get PCBWay to assemble the projects for you. I use PCBWay for all of my projects. I've never had a problem with quality. All you have to do on PCBWay is search for Amiga and you'll find a plethora of projects that will either enhance or replace the existing functionality of your Amiga. So thanks PCBWay for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to repairing this Amiga 500 Plus. Now most of the alkali has been neutralized. It's a matter of just picking away at flaky solder mask and traces, removing the metal oxides and hydroxides that have been left. Once that's been cleaned up, I can tin all the exposed copper and then start to work out where the breaks exist. So here in front of me, we've got PCB Explorer. In fact, I can share that with you now. So this is what I'm actually seeing. I'll be working through this to work out what I should be testing and where it should be connected to. And obviously, I'll need to write that down. The primary focus of my initial testing is going to be around U12 because that appears to have taken the brunt of the electrolyte from the battery leaking. Turn this over to start doing some work. Look at that. So I'm gonna now I've seen it, it's uh, just sort that out. To repair the brakes, I'm going to use pieces of wire on the back of the board to connect the closest two points that I can find. That will either be a via or to a pin directly. Because most of the signals that have been broken are underneath this chip, that makes it particularly difficult to repair the traces in situ. Though it would technically be possible, it's in my opinion a little bit tidier to do all of this corrective work on the back of the board. My method for attaching the bodge wires is to create a loop or a circle to attach around the pin. That means that it's less likely that this is going to get pulled off. I've managed to melt a little more shielding on the wires than I intended, so some of them I've shored up with some additional heat shrink insulation. So oh, looking at that, it's returning exactly the same data for every single memory location. I reached out to Glenn from CRG to see if he had any ideas as to what could be causing the problem. We worked through it logically and really couldn't find anything particularly wrong with what I'd done so far. It was at that point that I realised there was one thing I hadn't done. I checked connectivity to the Gary socket, but I hadn't tested whether Gary was connected to the socket. A little bit of probing around the centre pins, and it turns out a few of them weren't making a good connection. Straightening all those out and getting them perfectly straight and back into the socket. When at the cave I said this machine was probably savable and didn't look too bad. Well. I might have spoken too soon. And you can imagine Matt's reaction when I told him that this machine was in fact fully working.
Now the Amiga 500 Plus has a temporary home on my shelves, while Matt decides what he wants to do with the machine. Obviously, we need to do a repair to the keyboard, just a replacement of the membrane, which shouldn't be anything too technical or exciting. But with Amigas, you never know. So if you happen to have a vintage machine that you knew worked when you put it in the loft, do yourself a favour and pull it out, check for a battery, remove it, clean it up now. Because leaving it until it's too late may just mean that machine is not salvageable. <laughs>